in the name of God, our Creator, Jesus, our Redeemer, and the Holy Spirit, our Sustainer. Amen. The feeding of 5,000 is the only miracle of Jesus recounted in all four Gospels. In my role as a teacher, I often get questions about the legitimacy of a biblical story. Did Jonah really get swallowed by a? If a version of a story appears more than once in the Bible, the likelihood that it happened is great. The skeptics among us can rest assured that Jesus really did feed the multitudes. I've provided a handout for you all to follow along if you're interested, or as Sarah Boyle asked me today, right before we process, is this our homework, Cheryl? If you would like it to be, please let it be. So I'm going to, to go through this story and I'm going to tell you the similarities in the Gospels and I'm going to tell you how different, how unique the story is from John. So first of all, I wanna go over with something about Matthew, Mark, and Luke. When we refer to the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we have a special word for them. And I know that there's many EFM graduates in the room. I'm looking at you. Does anybody know that name of those three Gospels? Oh my goodness, you guys are fabulous. All right, the synoptics. And then John, he marches to a completely different tune. And I love that about John. But anyway, in the synoptics, which you can see on the handout that you have, the feeding comes right after the big bad Herod Antipas. Here's reports about Jesus's activity. But it has some different, interesting, intervening material. But I'm gonna begin with the shared story in all four gospels. And then I'm gonna show you how unique and distinctive John's version is. First, let's talk about the share. Jesus goes to a certain place and he's met by a multitude numbering at least 5,000. And there is a need from the crowd. There's only how many loaves? And how many fish? You are listening. A command is given for the people to sit. And then Jesus takes bread and offers a blessing and gives thanks. And food is distributed. All, not some, of the people eat until their hunger is satisfied. And then there are baskets of leftovers. How many baskets? Twelve. Do you remember from a previous sermon what the number 12 signifies? It represents in this story, the complete completion of an act or a state of being. And what we can deduce from that is that no one is left hungry under Jesus's rule. Everybody is satisfied. First lesson, the shared stories in the four gospels recall God's supply of manna in the wilderness through Moses. Remember the manna fell from where? from heaven. Yes, thank you all for answering. And it's also reminiscent of Elijah's feeding a hundred um, people with 20 loaves. In the Synoptic Gospels, that's Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the actions of Jesus taking the bread, blessing, and giving them are repeated in his final meal with his disciples. And it's instituted the Holy Eucharist, which we celebrate every single Sunday and every single Wednesday at 1215 in this place. The feeding of a miracle in some ways foreshadows the Last Supper. Now John, he doesn't narrate the institution the way that Matthew, Mark, and Luke do, yet he hints at it. There's definitely Eucharistic overtones. And you can see that in his message in, in the gospel that was read by Deacon Susie. 
We get that message, John. We know you didn't spell it out, you didn't narrate it like the others do, but you're telling us that this is Holy Eucharist. In the synoptic accounts of the feeding of, of 5,000, they're very similar, but there are some differences. Now let's talk about John and his differences. And you're gonna tell, I'll try not to get as excited as I did at the eight and the nine o'clock in talking about the differences, but you're gonna see who my favorite version is. First of all, John gives the Sea of Galilee its more up-to-date name, the Sea of Tiberias. Names are important to John. And I can resonate with that because I, when Patrick says to me, oh, let's go take a drive. I always say, where are we going? How long do you have the GPS up? So I like that. The other thing that John says is he says the crowds followed Jesus because they saw signs. Now sign is John's code word for miracle. Jesus' miracle, that's his word. So whenever you think, whenever you're reading scripture and John says sign, that's miracle. Jesus speaks and his disciples are going up a mountain. That's also unique. In the synoptics, um, Jesus goes to a deserted place, but in John, they go up a mountain. Does this remind you of any other story? And Lynn is nodding her head. Thank you, Lynn Smith. The Beatitudes, when Jesus goes up and he says, blessed are you. Do you remember? So I'm going to tell you this right now, that whenever someone goes up a mountain, it's important. We need to pay attention to it. And, and John is saying, this lesson is so important, I'm going to have Jesus go up a mountain. Whether he did or not, he's going up a mountain. The next thing that John does is he refers to the nearness of the Passover. And he does it two more times in the Gospel of John. Now you may say, why was the Passover meal so important to John? Why was that meal so important? He mentions it three times in the Gospel of John. Now let me tell you what I believe, and, and there is research to support it. It's just not Cheryl's belief. He's reminding the people of their ancestors and God's saving power of the Israelites. He's connecting the past with the present. And we do that all the time. When we celebrate Christmas, Easter, Thanksgiving, how many of us recall those memories with our children? Do we do those? Do we often make some of the same dishes that we had growing up? And God forbid you deviate, right? So he's reminding the people to be connected to their ancestors. I love that about John. In the synoptic version, it's the disciples who express the concern to feed the crowd. But in John, it's Jesus who identifies the problem. It's important for John that Jesus takes the initiative. And to show that Jesus is not baffled, he knows exactly what to do. And Jesus also, excuse me, John also names individuals in the feeding of 5,000. He names Philip and Andrew. And more importantly, he identifies a boy with how many loaves and two fish. Now, I'm not sure about the significance of naming Philip. You know, some of the commentaries I read said he was trying to quiz him, kind of, you know, are you up on your game? I'm, I'm not sure about that. But I'm going to tell you about St. Andrew. I do think the fact that Andrew pointed that out, that is significant. Andrew says, hey, there's someone there. There's a child there with, with loaves of bread. The other thing that, that Andrew does, or that, the, excuse me, John does, is he names the kind of bread, barley. And you may just skip right over that, because believe me, the first time I read this years and years and years ago, I skipped right over the barley. But let me tell you why barley is important. Again, that was the kind of loaves that Elisha fed the people. 
he fed them with barley loaves. So I think by identifying those specific loaves, he's saying, remember, your ancestors were fed with barley loaves. Now, someone at the uh, nine o'clock service, which I am so pleased that these nine o'clock parents in the midst of caring for their children actually pay attention, they said, oh, I think they did that because barley is gluten-free. <laughs> You all know I'm gluten-free. I said, well, I hadn't really thought about that, and I don't know if that's actually the case. I, I don't know. But anyway, it's important for John that the loaves are identified, and it's really important that a child is the one who provides the food. And I'm going to go a little bit um, on this thing. At Christ Church, our children and youth are so important to us, and I like the fact that John says a boy a young boy had what it took to feed multitudes. I think it tells us over and over again, Jesus loved children and we need to be attentive to our children. And I thank Susie today at the nine o'clock, but I'll do it again. I am so grateful every single day for Susie's ministry with our children. And then let's continue on. And in all the Gospels, you know, Jesus um, tells us and the Gospel writers tells us that there are 12 baskets left over. Now, I'm going to tell you something that I thought was absolutely hilarious. One of the commentaries that I read said, well, that must be because they want to reflect an ethical concern for conservation. Now, I'm going to tell you, I don't buy that at all. I think that's a 21st century value that we're putting on back then. Would you agree with me? Oh, thank you. I think rather what that's telling us, that message about 12 baskets being filled is that we are never, ever left unsatisfied when we come to this table. When Jesus feeds us, we are full, we are sati satiated. That is the message that I think John is telling us. And then the last part, John mentions that the people, I mean, were so enamored that Jesus fed this many people that they want to make him an earthly king. And Jesus says no, and he leaves. Because Jesus, we know, is not an earthly king. Jesus is an eternal king. And I think John is reminding that of us over and over again. Jesus is an eternal king, an earthly king. What, what's the, what, why don't we want Jesus to be an earthly king? It's temporal. And that opening colic we pray today was God, let us get through the temporal and focus on the eternal. So John's account of feeding the 5,000, I feel is more distinctive than the versions found in the synoptics. But I want you to read the synoptics as evident by the handout I gave you. It's the same central story, but there's some twist, okay? So Mark, when you go home and you read this, he gives the, the appraisal of the crowd, like he looks out and he says, oh, they're like shepherdless sheep. That's Mark's version. I like that. Okay, shepherd with sheep. Matthew, when he tells the story, he talks about the scope of the miracle. 5,000, can you believe it? That's his focus. And Luke talks about the prominence of Jesus being the host. He's the man. But John singles out individuals, Philip, Andrew, and the boy. John emphasizes Jesus' control over the situation. John emphasizes that Jesus is a eternal king, not one of this world. Okay, we've just jumped in and we've analyzed this in the time that's allowed, and you're probably saying, so what's the message for me? I'm sitting in the pews, what does this mean? First and foremost, Jesus' mission and his message to us is important. We need to take note. He went up the mountain 
to preach it. Second, he mentioned the Passover meal, not once, not twice, but three times in the gospel. We need to remember our ancestors. They are important to who we are. They are important to our identity. Yes, right now, our ancestors are important to us. It reminds us that Jesus has saved us and will continue to save us. And then third, when Jesus sees a need, he not only takes care of our physical needs, our emotional needs, but he takes care of our spiritual needs. And we do that every single time we come to the Holy Eucharist. The feeding of 5,000 is important and it is legitimate. The Synoptic Gospels tell a lovely story, but friends, I love John's version. Which one do you like? Amen.